Good afternoon, everybody. It is truly my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the 2019 Makhlouf Haddadin Lecture. We are very thrilled to host Professor Omar Farha from Northwestern University to deliver the 2019 Makhlouf Haddadin Lecture. Professor Haddadin is the longest serving faculty member at AUB. He's a distinguished eminent scholar in organic chemistry with extraordinary contributions to the chemistry department, AUB, and the community at large. On February 8, 2011, the Makhlouf Haddadin Endowment was initiated, and on March 18, 2015, the Makhlouf Haddadin Lectureship was launched. Professor Farha is the 11th speaker of the Makhlouf Haddadin Lectureship. Professor Farha is a professor of chemistry at Northwestern University, president of NUMAT Technologies, and associate editor of the journal ACS Applied Materials and Interfaces. His research accomplishments have been recognized by several awards and honors, including the GSCC International Award for Creative Work, the Royal Society of Chemistry, Environment, Sustainability, and Energy Division Early Career Award, the American Chemical Society, the Satinder Ahuja Award for Young Investigators in Separation Science, and an award established by the Department of Chemistry at the Northwestern University in his honor, the Omar Farha Award for Research Leadership, which is awarded for stewardship, cooperation, and leadership in the finest pursuit of research in chemistry, and is given annually to an outstanding research scientist working in the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. In his early 40s, Professor Farha has established a very prominent career with more than 400 peer-reviewed publications, 15 patents, around 44,000 citations. Literally, in the last month, the number of citations increased 1,000. And an H index of 100, according to Google Scholar. Professor Farha has been named a highly cited researcher in 2014, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and a couple of days ago, he was also named a highly researcher, highly cited researcher in 2019. Professor Farha's talk is entitled Programmable Smart Sponges. Before I hand the floor to Professor Farha to deliver his 2019 Makhlouf Haddadin lecture, I invite Professor Haddadin and Professor Farha to join me here. Professor Haddadin will be handing a small token of appreciation to our distinguished guest, and I will hand a copy of the seminar Announcement to Professor Farha. Will you please start right there? <laughs> Professor Farha, the floor is yours. Can you guys hear me? Great. So, Bilal, thank you so much for. I would say a very, very generous introduction. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. I'm sure you have better things to do, so I appreciate you coming to hear what I gotta tell you for the next 50 minutes. Uh, but more importantly, uh, I wanna thank the person who actually I'm giving the lecture in his name. Uh, I would say he is a giant in the chemistry field. He's one of my idols especially for scientists coming from this part of the world, seeing people like Dr. Haddadin and what he accomplished in the last uh, 40, 50 years is astonishing. If I could accomplish 10% of that, I'll be very proud. So truly, it's an honor to be here. And hopefully, I'll share with you today about what we do scientifically and tomorrow about at least where I got uh, to this point and how I got to this point. So the title of my program uh, from the talk today is Programmable Smart Sponges. And you'll see in a few slides what I mean by uh, sponges and what I mean by programmable. Uh, but I might be lying when I say we. 
I didn't do anything. I am standing here just telling you what this wonderful group of people been working on for the last many years. I will share with you today about one of the projects we're working on for the last seven to eight years. I would say close to 50 uh, human years. So if you count how many graduate students and how many postdocs, and I have to put that in about 45 minutes. So that's not really fair to my graduate students and postdocs, but that's the way it goes to tell a story. Without the funding agencies, we wouldn't be here today. So today I will be talking about metal organic frameworks. Uh, and from the name, those are made from metal clusters or metal ions, organic lincolns. And I always say, we do not make supermolecular assemblies. We make materials that goes in multiple dimensions. Two-dimensional materials, three-dimensional materials. I personally enjoy working with these materials for two reasons. One, because you have the, you know, the table of elements. You have many to choose from, from the most expensive to the very uh, ch the cheap elements. You have a couple hundred years worth of organic chemistry. You could make materials using the benzene dicarboxylic acid, which a lot of us drink water from these kind of bottles. That's what the, the starting material of these plastics coming from. So you could see these are cheap uh, starting material, all the way to more sophisticated ligands and anything in between. So I hear all the time, are moth expensive? The question is, they could be, or they could be cheap too. It depends which of those two and how you mix them uh, together. Additionally, these materials, in my view, and happy to discuss this during Q&A, are programmable and scalable. And you could actually, my company, we make them at about a half a metric ton a batch. So we're not talking about a few milligrams. We start with few milligrams in my lab, but can be scaled at almost half a metric ton, and soonish it will be about a metric ton per batch. So this is what I'm showing here about eight hour reaction. Very quickly, you saw cloudy, it dissolves, then start to crystallize, and each one of those are beautiful single crystals. What, what I'm trying to get here, that the reaction conditions are so gentle that you could do it in these glass containers and actually with your iPhone monitor the reaction from your home, watching the crystallization of these materials literally taking place into the, from the, micro, into the micron and the millimeter uh, level. And there is, I would say, modular building blocks. So when you have a modular building blocks, you have tremendous number of possibilities to build from. That allows you to get hundreds of thousands, even millions, at least in the hypothetical sense, into materials with different morphologies, different topologies, different you know, chemical properties, different physical properties. But what distinguishes this class of material over other porous classes of material is the ability to be able to get those at the single crystal structure. Why is that important? Because knowing the crystal structure down to the atomic level, down to the angstrom level, allow you to handle these homogeneous, heterogeneous solid materials the way you would handle a homogeneous material dissolved in a solution. Because you know exactly where everything is. But at the same time, that's the good news. But what the bad news is, because you have so many MOFs to choose from, then which material do you make for what application? And we don't want to do it in the random sense the way here, like just few options. You could get to about 15,000 different materials. So which one do you go and which one do you make? We don't want to do that. We want to start using supercomputers in order to narrow down from hundreds of thousands to a handful, go to the lab and make it and test it and see if we got the answer correctly or not, or we could do that feedback loop to get to the right answer very quickly. The way they come in the lab, they look beautiful crystals, different morphologies, different topologies, and we'll talk about this, in a, and that's how they look like. For the rest of the talk for clarity and simplicity, I won't be showing you powders and crystals, I will be showing you the smallest repeating unit. And what do I mean by that? If you take that millimeter size crystal, 
and diving all the way to the nano regime, you will get this small repeating unit that it goes in the X, Y, and Z in three-dimensional to build those, I would say, beautiful 3D networks. So in our lab, we would like to do what we call a hypothesis is driven and not just, you know, shake and bake and mix and see what you get. So what do I mean by that? If you have a hypothesis, and let's say the hypothesis, you want to run this reaction, and you want to hydrolyze this PF bond into this POH bond, because we grow this material and we know the crystal structure, uh, you know exactly what material you want to make. And in this case, as an example, we found that zirconium is a good Lewis acid catalyst. So we did that, we made the material, we ran the catalysis. I mean, this, I, I'm just giving this as a quick example how we go around the problem. We tested, it was okay. We learned from enzymes that having a base in close proximity makes the catalysis better, and you could see it gets better. And now, if you just change where this amine location into from the meta to the para, now you get from generation three catalyst, is that much better than generation one? Why I'm saying that? Because if you have an amorphous material, that means you don't know the crystal structure, how can you even go and go to just moving the functional group by two angstroms away changes the efficiency of that catalyst. The only way you could do that is really knowing what the crystal structure is. In our group, we are a synthetic group at, a, at heart. So that's the core of our group. We work in gas storage, gas separation, water purification, chemical separation, all the way to even blood purification and dialysis. Uh, happy to discuss this during Q&A. I wouldn't be talking about it, but we actually work on project how to purify blood from toxic chemicals, all the way to heterogeneous catalysis, and we go into the part of the periodic table, the actinide chemistry, that most chemists, they don't want to even go there because they have the F orbitals and nobody wants to deal with those uh, you know, orbitals. Today, I want to concentrate on this part of the, uh, of the you know, the work we do in our group into the heterogeneous catalysis world. But we want to go visit what nature gives us. Nature gives us enzymes to do those catalysis because they are very selective, very specific. They are very quick. What I mean by that, they have high turnover frequencies. Some of them, they could do the re 100,000 reactions per second. That's how fast these enzymes are. If you talk to enzymologists, and I'm not sure if anyone in the audience, maybe there is and they could challenge me on that, there is a reason why enzymologists don't talk about turnover numbers. They talk about turnover frequencies because they are quick, but they die very quickly too. If you take them out of their environment and now take them out of the water, put them at a har in harsh condition in high bases, high acids, high temperatures, those enzymes will die very quickly. The question is, in this lecture, I want to hopefully convince you, how can we take nature's catalyst and stabilize it to be able to do catalysis under really, really harsh conditions? If we could do that, that can change few industries that enzyme can be implemented, but right now it's not used because of instability. And I said that already. The, the problem with this is uh, enzymes under harsh conditions like temperatures, pHs, there is a dehydration, and that's the denaturation, and that stops the catalyst from working. If you could solve this problem, you could go all the way from detoxification, biofuel industry, pharma, water treatment, and I'm only listing a handful of industries that can benefit from this. The way we want to do it we want to be able to take this enzyme and encapsulate them inside those cavities of those MOFs, but we want to be able to access them. And we'll see, would that encapsulation increase their stability? And if it does, how much does it increase the stability? There is many ways of encapsulating an enzyme. Imagine this sphere is the enzyme. You could do it ship in a bottle. That, uh, that means you could just put it in the cavities, the apertures are a lot smaller, 
than the cavities. That means the enzyme cannot leach out. Or you could do it in a pseudo 1D channel type materials. For today, I want to zoom in even further and talk only about the pseudo 1D channel materials and why I think, in my humble opinion, that this is the strategy to go after. And if we want to start with using this technology in a detoxifying very toxic chemicals as a, a, a proof of concept. And this is the reaction we want to go after, is how can we take this toxic molecule that attacks your DNA, and if you hydrolyze it with water to this POH bond, that stops the toxicity, and at that point, you don't get attacked, your DNA doesn't get attacked, and you'll be just fine. It sounds simple, but this is really a tough transformation to do it very quickly. However, there is an enzyme called phosphotriesterase. This enzyme has two zinc, a hydrogen you know, and uh, an OH, few bases, carboxylic acid. If I was uh, given a different talk, I will tell you how we are inspired by this active side to make a synthetic analog to be able to do this. But for today, we want to concentrate how to stabilize this enzyme that has the ability to take a super toxic chemical to something that does not harm you. And the way we want to do it is encapsulation in mouse. But the idea is why those chemicals are toxic to us as humans. Allow me to take just 30 seconds to tell you that. Because we all have you know, an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase, this enzyme, its job to take neurotransmitter after you do a function and do this reaction cleave this molecule in half, and that action will stop. For example, now it's telling me change the slide or change it back. Once I do that, now this enzyme is cleaving this instantaneously and stopping me from keep pushing the buttons over and over again to keep changing the slide. But this enzyme has other things that it controls. It controls your muscles. It controls your breathing. And if you have no control over your muscles, over your breathing, that leads to other you know, instances that could lead actually to death very quickly. And the reason for that, this toxic molecule goes and binds into the bucket of that enzyme, and it binds irreversibly, and now that enzyme completely inactive. So the question is, how we want to go about stabilizing the enzyme that, got, that detoxify that agent before it gets to you? We, our design principle, can you make a MOF or a metal organic framework that has two channels? One channel is larger than the other, but the two channels communicate. Why is that important? We want to put the enzymes in the large channel, but not in the smaller channel. And as a PowerPoint chemistry, that's what I say. This is so far, I'm showing you PowerPoint chemistry. That means I could draw whatever I want on that slide. And very soon, I have to prove to you how to translate it into reality. Why is that important? We want to be able to get starting materials in, and we want to get products out and do it in a hierarchical fashion. This way, there is no diffusion limitation. If we don't have that, we only have the large channel, this molecule will have a hard time diffusing. They will see enzyme 1. And if they diffuse this way, they will see enzyme 2. But anything in between, they wouldn't be able to see. And that would be restricted. So this way, allow us to remove that restriction. The question is, how can we take PowerPoint chemistry into practice? There is one way you could think about it. And if I was given a different lecture, I will spend almost 30 minutes deciding why we decided on this particular topology. But this topology has exactly what we need. We have the hexagon channel that has almost, let's say, close to 3 nanometers. It has a triangle, is about 1.2, 1.3 nanometers. And it has those windows in between. So we don't have those cylinders and channels in between. This is as close as it get a get from what I showed you, the PowerPoint chemistry, into practice. But that's still PowerPoint chemistry. I didn't show you anything chemically here and how we get to build it. So, the way we think about MOFs, at least in our group, is first we want to understand what conditions we want to make these materials in. 
and we want to make them to be very stable under harsh conditions. So we decided to take zirconium metal organic frameworks. And in this, you have a zirconium cluster made out of six zirconiums. And the number 12 connected, it means to have 12 carboxylic acid bound to those six zirconiums. We picked zirconium because they are zirconium carboxylic acid is a very strong bond. That means you could put these materials in pH is 1 to pH 10, water, boil it, you'll be just fine. But you could think about, now the question is, how do you build the topology I just told you about, the triangle, the hexagon? You could think about those zirconium-6 as geometric you know, object, the way I'm showing them right here, all the way from 12 connected. But even the 12 connected, you could see we have a, a different way, or if you go all the way down to four connected, and the number of connectivity here is how many carboxylic acids around that same zirconium-6 node. Or we could take this geometric entities into real chemical structures, and that's how they look like. You, and we are able to make all these building blocks. Now let's talk about the organic part. It's the same way. You could think about them from two connected to three ways of connecting, all the way to six. You could see even in the four ways of connected, you could do a square planar, you could do a tetrahedron. In the six connected, you could do it three ways. And I'm just giving you a handful of examples. How can you translate this to a chemical uh, materials? You could make those organic compounds. And now you could start thinking about those as like tinker toys, uh, mixing and matching those molecules. And if you do that, but you have to take another thing into account uh, is I, I, I always call it details matter. What do I mean by that? Just the ability to have three carboxylic acid is not enough. You have to worry about how much rotation you have because just that amount of rotation dictates three different topologies. So just making a, a, a ligand that has three connectivity does not guarantee which topology you want to get. You need to understand exactly the rotation and how those morphologies or those functional groups with respect to the zirconium MOFs. In the last couple years, our group actually discovered two topologies that we are happy to say even you know, mathematicians did not think about. And we were able now to add to the crystallography databases in new objects that others can now take and modify and build a cool stuff with that has not been shown before. This material we just deposited literally a month ago. It's not even published yet, but we deposited early because we really want people to go and make more of it and decorate it in any way they want. Let's go back to the previous example, which how do we build now this topology we want. You could see we pick this linker and we pick the zirconium with the four connectivity and we make this material. In our group, we could actually make grams of these things, so we're not talking about few crystals. And that's the shape, hexagonal rods. That's the way the topology comes about. This is now the single crystal structure, so this is not a PowerPoint chemistry anymore. Now this is reality, that's how the material looks. One thing I want to show you, if you dive in, this is the hexagon and that's the triangle, and those are the windows where the communication happens between the hexagons and those triangles. And we started with a simple in, uh, enzyme before we go to the, you know, the phosphotriesterase, which you have to work hard at making, we decided to go buy something from Aldridge, approve our concept, then go back to the enzyme we wanted to start with at the beginning. This particular enzyme, it's a hydrolase, and you'll see the reaction we decided to go about. It's smallish, it's about three nanometer, which fits perfectly in the MOF we just made, and it's easy to obtain because we literally can buy it from Aldridge if we need to. That's where the enzyme should fit. How do we know that? We do, uh, first, we put the enzyme after we make the MOF. We put the enzyme post-synthetically. Uh, how do you know that the enzyme inside the channels? We actually put chromophores, we tag this enzyme with chromophores, and with confocal, we could follow the enzyme going all the way to the inside of those uh, crystals. The smaller the crystallites, the faster the diffusion. One thing you should pay attention to, that the enzyme is only diffusing from the two ends, but not from this side. 
And the reason for that, because the large hexagonal channels only start from the ends of those crystals and not from the sides of the crystals. The sides of the crystals are the windows, which the enzyme should not fit, and you don't see it moving this way. It's only moving in this direction. We characterize this material, and we know that we made the right, the right thing. That's the PXRD. But more importantly, how do we know that it went into the hexagon, but not the triangle? So what do we do here? And some people sitting in the audience are, they use this technique all the time as well. You know, taking a nitrogen isotherm. What do I mean by taking a nitrogen isotherm? At 77K, you, you use the uptake of nitrogen with pressure. You see here, that's NU1000, the MOF I showed you before we put the enzyme. This step here, that's a signature of the 3.2 nanometer. If it wasn't there, that means we don't have that mesoporous channel. Trust me for that, and we'll revisit this in a few slides. Look what ha from this nitrogen isotherm, we could extract three data points or three pieces of information. One, the pore volume, how much porosity inside, the surface area, and the pore size distribution. So from that black, we extracted this black spectra. But look when we put the enzyme. Nothing happened to the small channel, and all the reduction went from the large channel. That means that's where the enzyme is really residing. And you could see that step reduced drastically because that's the signature of that's the hexagon. This enzyme is capable of doing this hydrol It's a hydrolase taking this ester into this acid, and we monitor the, you know, the nitrophenol using UV vis to see how much of that product we are, uh, we are making. So this enzyme is very efficient. Uh, it works quite well. So this is the adsor uh, adsorbent. Here is the MOF itself, so it doesn't do this reaction. We know the enzyme is doing this reaction. And when we filter our material out, you do the reaction and there is no reaction. That means we're not really leaching out the enzyme into the solution and doing a homogeneous catalysis. This is a real heterogeneous reaction from the composite. But I told you this, this re we know this enzyme does this reaction, but did we make it more stable than the way we started with? So this particular enzyme like to be around detergent because otherwise it aggregates and precipitates. You could see if we do this reaction without detergent, the composite is doing a lot better than the uh, free enzyme. But you might argue, okay, Omar, you increased it a little bit. Who cares? Uh, can, you, can we do better than that? And the answer is yes. Because in the presence of urea or a lot of hydrogen bonding moieties, that look what the free enzyme is doing. It's really dead before we even start it. And the composite keeps working. More importantly, now we could add THF, a seronitrile, take an enzyme that it, it dies in the presence of those organic solvents and now run reactions in the presence of organic solvents. The pharma industry would love to do that. That's exactly where we want to go with. But more importantly, now we could filter after we finish the reaction, we filter the material and we do the reaction again and again and again and again. Every time we do that, that additional turnover numbers. So we maintain the turnover frequency and we increase the turnover numbers even under harsh conditions. So, that's, so now we know that this strategy works. The question is, did we really get lucky with that? I showed you, you know, large channels, small channel communication. Did we get lucky or that's really the topology we should stick with going forward? How do you really analyze that question? We decided to go make four different MOFs. Some of them was already made in the, uh, you know, in the literature. Every time there is a hexagon is the same size, about 3.2 nanometer. Every time there is a triangle is about 1.2 nanometer. So that means we're keeping the channel sizes constant. The variables, look here, we have communication. That's what I showed you so far. Can we make another topology that there is a wall? There is no communication to see what's the importance of that window between the channels. Or let's remove that triangle. Did I, you know, do we really need that triangle for things to go in and out? Let's do only hexagons with communications and hexagons without communications. So let's go make all these materials. And we made 
all these four MOFs, and we put the enzymes inside those four MOFs. One thing we needed to address, or a couple things we needed to address, the first one is what's the contribution on the enzyme sitting on the outside of the crystal versus the enzyme inside the crystal? We did not want to address that question, so what we did, we used a trick that biologists use, a trypsin digestion. It's a very large enzyme. It's in the acid. It's job to go chew up everything else. And that means it will go destroy the enzymes on the surface, and that's one way of clean up anything on the surface. But this enzyme is so large, it cannot fit into the crystal. That means the enzyme in the crystals would not be affected. So this way, we don't have to address this question, what's on the outside and what's on the inside. The second thing we wanted to address is we cannot say how many of those enzymes are active. We could say how many of those enzymes accessible. And how can we count those accessible enzymes? There is a, a, a titrant or a chromophore. This phosphate typically will go binds to the active site, and it will release this chromophore, and it does that once because that phosphate inhibits the, chromophore, uh, the active site. That means the enzyme is not a catalyst anymore. And for every chromophore, we could count one enzyme. That means we could start counting how many of those enzymes are accessible. The results, these are the best two materials. What you could see in black is before we clean up the surface, in red after we clean up the surface. One thing you should notice that if you don't have triangle, you could put twice the amount of enzyme inside the crystals as the one with half triangle. It's not surprising, because those triangles, we cannot put enzyme in them. That's the empty space we need. But more importantly than how many enzymes you could put in those topologies is how many enzymes are actually accessible to do the job. If you look at the one we put twice as much, less than 5% are accessible, which makes sense. Only the one by the windows, because this large molecule cannot diffuse to see the other enzymes, versus the one I told you about, we get more than 95% of those enzymes are accessible. So that's great. Now, let's move to the enzyme I told you about that it does that detoxification. The first thing we see, that this particular enzyme is much larger than the first moth we made. But that's OK. The first thing we did, you go expand the ligand. And we'll tell you later that just expanding the ligand randomly is not the right strategy. But in this case, we expanded the ligand. You made a larger cavity. Now we could put this enzyme in the cavity. And I'm not going to repeat how we characterize this material. Take my word for it. We did exactly what we did in the first example. But we know it's inside, it's active, and it's the right topology. And now we could do the catalysis. This is what we used as a less toxic material. And we could actually see that the catalysis works quite well. And you could see from the phosphorus NMR that you have two peaks for the starting material because the fluorine split the phosphorus. And you only have one peak for the OH. Everything now makes sense. When we test this composite, that's what you see from the back round. That's from just the water, the buffer, or the MOF itself. This is the free enzyme. And when you do the composite, that's what we get. So I, I always say on this slide, there is good news and there is challenges. The good news, if you wait 30 minutes, you're OK. The challenge is our, free, our composite is a lot slower than the free enzyme. But that's something we have to go back and see how we get to address. Now let's address the stability. Did we get lucky the first time? Or can we stabilize this stabilization is a more general strategy. If you take the enzyme, the free enzyme or the composite, heat it at different temperature, then run the reaction, you could see that after a while, only the composite survive and the free enzyme start to degrade. You could do even a harsher trick. If you want to start shipping enzymes for catalysis for pharma around the world, you want to do it as powder. Nobody wants to ship things in freezers because that costs money. The way to take it, you take the enzyme and you lophilize it, or you take our composite and you, uh, you dry it. You put it on the bench at room temperature, 
and every day take a small amount and do the catalysis. By day four, the free enzyme is completely dead versus our composite, nothing happened. You could even test it with harsher uh, chemical uh, toxins and day zero and day 50 all the way to six months, this material does not change. But now we have to address that problem with the initial rate that the free enzyme is much faster. How do you go about that? Is by making the crystallite smaller or you make the triangular channel larger for things to go in and out faster and those windows between the channel larger for things to diffuse even faster. We mint another material called NU1003. So you could see we make a lot of organic linkers. So we are not really, we collaborate with Sir Fraser to make some of those linkers and others we make them uh, ourselves if needed. We made NU1003 larger channels. We put the enzyme the same way, so I'm not gonna go through that. Uh, but we need to characterize that. You could see we are able to go from 10,000 nanometers or 10 microns all the way to 300 nanometers and we could make it monodisperse. This is the PXRD or can you, this is the signature that we made the right material. But PXRD can fool you because if you made anything non-crystalline you cannot see it. But we test that with nitrogen isotherm and you could see the porosity of all these materials almost identical. That means now we made large particles, we made small particles and things in between and everything is uniform. Now let's test the catalysis. One thing I wanted you to pay attention to, the first example of this particular enzyme I showed you that we got from our collaborator plateaued around 80%. This one is a more active batch. In the six months it took us to make things larger, channels, and get this distribution of particles they were tweaking the active site of that enzyme to make it even more potent enzyme. Now our job is even harder. We're not gonna compete against the enzyme that plateaued at 80%. We have to compete against that, that as soon as you take the NMR of almost the first point, it's like 95% done. So that's now the challenge we had to face. So we went and we tested our material. If you have large five micron, you could see we saw something similar. You make your material smaller, it gets better, smaller still. When we go to the nano regime, we see that our first point is complete by the time we take the NMR. When my postdoc showed me this result, I actually told him he did something wrong. He needs to go repeat the experiment. He repeated the experiment, got the same thing. Now I got a PhD student. I thought the postdoc is just in a hurry to get things done. The PhD student, repeated the experiment, got the same thing. So why do you think I'm not really believing this result when I saw it first? As soon as you remove the diffusion problem, now we make a material that has even higher initial rate than the free enzyme. But how is that possible? Things had to diffuse in, diffuse out. Uh, during q and I'm happy to tell you what we're doing right now to understand that problem. But did that, does that work only at Northwestern University or at our, you know, our collaborator's lab as well? Our collaborator does the same thing and they see higher initial rate than, we, uh, than what, uh, the same thing we see at Northwestern University. So that's a validation. Beside the stability, now we have even a higher initial rate, faster catalysis as well. So what I showed you so far is we are able to uh, take a material that only if it needs the substrate and nothing else. But most enzyme, they require a coenzyme to work with or a cofactor. Those coenzymes and those cofactor are really large molecules. So we decided to test this hypothesis. If we take this particular large enzyme, which is LDH, it's job to take pyruvate to lactate using this NADH. And you could see this molecule is really large. So we're not just diffusing a CO2 molecule or a nitrogen molecule into those MOFs. That's what you need to diffuse into the MOFs. This is really large. And how we gonna do that? Let's talk about, this is just putting it in perspective to see the size. Let's do PowerPoint chemistry again. If you take the small image and you keep stretching it, 
yeah, you could make a larger moth and you would say, okay, that's the way to do it in a proposal at least. We could solve it that way. But one thing I didn't tell you so far, if you have a ligand that has four arms and it's a square, it has four options to make four different topologies. It could make whatever we want. It could make the FTW or the uh, 412 topology, which is like a cube. It could make things that triangular, or it could make this diamond shape. The question is, how can we only make ligands that make this particular topology and not the other three? For the last couple years, we learned that those two topologies are the kinetic product. How do you get a kinetic product? Heat the reaction higher, and you move to the thermodynamic. Both of those are thermodynamic products. The question is, how can you distinguish between them? One thing we had to go and learn by looking at the coordination chemistry of those ligands into the zirconium, we learned one small thing, that this small thing can make a huge difference which material do you make. Ignore what's in between this fennel at the end of the ligand and the center of the ligand. That does not matter. This fennel matters the most. If this rotation between this fennel and this ligand is 180 degrees or zero, that means it's flat, you will only make the FTW or those boxes. Or if they are 55 degrees to 65 degrees, in principle, they should only make the topology that we want, the two-channel topology. Let's test this hypothesis. We made all this planar ligands that I talked about between this fennel and this pyrene or this fennel and this, and you could see you don't even need a crystal structure to see this is not the hexagonal rod I've been showing you, those are cubes. And we use these for a different application, but that tests that the hypothesis work. Now, let's go make optimized ligands that has that 55 to 65 degree angle, and we made all this ligand in collaboration with Sir Fraser Stark. And if we optimize them that now this rotation here is between 55 and 65 degrees, and we go and we make this, you don't have any of those boxes, you get the hexagonal rods. And that's the topology we want. We could even now do STEM to see that we made the right topology, and you could see where those, this is the triangle, and that's the hexagon. A few years ago, you couldn't even do Unless you have K3 or K2 cameras, you will burn those organic using that STM. Uh, but now we could see even the cluster of those zirconiums and see exactly the structure down to the nano regime. With the crystal structure, we could go, go down to the angstrom level. And that's what we did. We could match that our bulk matches our single crystals. More importantly, what I'm putting here, one year worth of work of a postdoc in one slide. This is what I started with, the NU1000, that the three nanometers in the hexagon, and now look where the thre three nanometers, that's the triangle, and now look at the windows are quite large. Now we put, a, more importantly, before we put the enzyme, remember I told you at the step right here, this is a signature of a mesoporous material? After a while, you start to see two steps. Why is that? Because now the triangle, and the hexagon, both are in the mesoporous regime. And if you don't see that, that's a problem. And if you, now we get to test our largest one, the uh, seven nanometer. This is the nitrogen isotherm. If you put the enzyme in the large channel, you could see the reduction only happened from the hexagonal channel. And if you put the cofactor in the triangle, you could see the reduction happens in the triangle. So this is indirect evidence that exactly that uh, two, you know, the, two, the two channels really work uh, together and you need both channels. How do we test the reactivity of these materials? We use, this takes pyruvate to lactate, but now we use this non-fluorescent dye and when the reaction happens for every turnover number, it gets you a, fl a fluorescent signal and we start counting the fluorescence. This is without uh, any catalyst. This is the homogeneous catalyst throwing everything dissolved in solution. If you have the smaller channels, you have a slower kinetics for our composite. Once you remove the diffusion, 
beside the extra stability, now we have three material with even higher uh, initial rate cat catalysis than the homogeneous. That's a second example. I didn't give you any, you know, why we think that's happening, uh, but hopefully during Q&A we could go through that as well. But we see that, that means it's not only for one example, it's more general than we think. This is just drawing the data in a different way. If you have diffusion issue, it's slower, you get rid of the diffusion, you will make a better catalyst than the free enzyme. So, so far I've been able to show you that we could put enzyme, move things in and out. In the next five minutes, I wanna show you where we are now and where we're going next with this kind of beside catalysis. You know, you could put enzymes into those uh, ch you know, channels. Can you put enzymes and stabilize them into those channels and get them out when you need them to deliver them for something else? Let's think about therapeutics. So what's an enzyme we decided to go after is insulin. Because I am certain everybody in this room, they know somebody who's diabetic. And why I'm picking on insulin? Because so far, the way to take care of insulin, you need an injection. Every, almost every medication that you could go to the doctor, you could get a tablet for. Why there is no tablets for insulin? Especially for young children, and instead of getting stabbed every morning, why can't they take a tablet? The, and that's actually, I was a naive way my wife in medicine, so I went to her and I said, you know, why, why you guys cannot figure that out? And she uh, educated me about the problems of insulin. So insulin, as soon as it goes into the stomach, the acidity and the other enzymes in the stomach, it chews it up so bad that 0% of it makes it into the blood. So the idea, the naive idea we had, can you make a uh, one of those sponges or those moths that has the right coordination, that it's stable under the stomach conditions, once it makes it to the blood, there is a lot of phosphate buffers there, it, it allows it to degrade and release the insulin. So can you make it into an oral uh, you know, way of delivery instead of the injection? So that's the idea, encapsulated, and definitely if you make the, find the right conditions, you could do that, and if you remember, the acids that we used to clean up the surface of the other uh, crystals, that's exactly what's in the stomach. That means they are too large to go inside the cavity, but they didn't destroy our moths either. So we know those moths would work. Now, we want them, once they get to the blood, to start break apart and release the insulin. Does it work? So this is as a proof of concept. We already did it, we tested it in cells. We didn't even go to animals. We're in the process of applying for NIH money to, for them to fund us to do that. Uh, you, we could put the insulin in the muff, that's no big deal. This is more importantly that if you do it now in the stomach conditions, within experimental error, nothing gets released. That means the MOF is stable, the enzyme doesn't get, how do we know? Because we have a tag on the enzyme to monitor how many of those ligands are actually released. If you put it in the blood condition, you start release it slowly. Actually, we could control this release in the blood to be very fast or very slow. That means that depends on what kind of dia diabetes you had. That can be released over a week or it can be released over a few hours after, let's say you have a meal if you need to. So now let's test the stability of this material. This is how this is the amount of enzyme we start with, 100%. So that's what we start with. Now we load it into the MOF, and we do nothing except we load it in the MOF, we break the MOF, and we get it out to see that our method of breaking the MOF is not destroying the enzyme. We get it all out. That's good. Now let's put it in the, uh, in the acidic media. We get almost within a quantitative, uh, uh, you know, within experimental error. Now let's put it in the stomach media that we buy uh, already mixed with all the enzyme, we just buy that cocktail. And we put uh, the material, we could get within experimental error almost 85% of it to release after the stomach condition into a blood 
re related condition. Now let's see what a, a free enzyme looks like. You literally get 0% of that to make it through. I am not saying we solved the problem, but this is to me a step forward in that regard. Why this is important? Because insulin has no IP, no patent. Nobody owns insulin. Insulin is a free agent. You know what the pharmaceuticals own? The way you deliver insulin to the patient, those injectors. That means if you change the way you do delivery, you're technically changing the whole entire industry because that's a new technology. So that's where we are right now. We didn't stop there. We went and we decorated the surface of those materials with DNA to make them biocompatible. We could get them into the cells with collaboration with my colleague Merkin, Chad Merkin, and we showed that this material has absolutely no toxicity, but now we could actually get more of those enzymes to make it into the cells than just the free enzyme alone. So I hope I showed you this encapsulation method, it doesn't just get you to the catalysis and solve some pharma organic reaction, but also we gotta go into the therapeutic uh, way of delivering those enzymes. Uh, and with that, thank you and happy to take any questions. I have a question regarding the design of the MOF. I'm a graduate student, I work actually with MOFs. So basically, we have a really hard time in determining the, the coordination environment of the secondary building unit. Is there an approach like to make sure how, this, uh, the, how the secondary building unit is gonna be adopted during the design, or it's just like trial and error? No, honestly, a lot of those building, the new ways of doing, at least in my group, doing those MOFs and other groups are doing the same thing is we isolate that building block first. Oh. And we isolate it with benzoic acids. And so we make that hexanuclear structure, we get it, and we use that as our zirconium mm. uh, salt to start with. Uh, same thing, you could do that with zinc acetate. Why you use zinc acetate to build air moths? Mm. Because zinc acetate already had, uh, you know, it has the, the you know, the SPU that you need. So it's not in situ directly. It's in, not we, when, uh, the, you could do that in situ if you have control over the building block, but sometimes uh, zirconium has its own way of thinking, mm -hmm. uh, and it depends on how much water you have. It might go into other areas. So we prefer to make the SPU first and use it as our starting point. Thank you. Dr. Ghaddar, can you please uh, pass the microphone? Uh, Omar. This is super chemistry. I think you should call these super enzymes. <laughs> uh, I have three small questions. Uh, the first one, how can your students work with these chemical weapons that you showed us? They don't. They don't? They use the simulant. Okay. And uh, the toxic chemicals are uh, done by professionals. Outside. Not outside Northwestern University. I see, okay. You got it. Okay. That's what I said. Let's see what happens with the simulant. Is it in our collaborator lab works the same? If you looked at those chemicals are different. One is a simulant, one exactly. is a, the real toxins. Exactly. Uh, another question, uh, how come it is easy, it's very easy to bring the enzyme inside the pores, but they do not leach out? That's a good question. Uh, because the way we load them under different pHs, you could change the the charges on the surfaces of the enzyme and the right charges inside the MOF. Okay. You make the zirconium clusters in the positive sense, you make the surfaces in the negative sense, and they go together and they don't wanna leach. We could test them six months later and there is no leaching. But that's why the community at the beginning were challenging us by saying ship in a bottle is the way to go because there is no leaching. But we told them you cannot get those large organic molecules into small materials. Some of you guys know like a ZIF-8 or whatever it is, we had to go into those large two channels. The good news, some of the people who challenged us are now using our techniques. <laughs> I'm gonna give the floor to Dr. Muffa Haddadin who is a pharmacist, so uh, he can educate you. us about. Thank you. Uh, 
It was an exciting lecture, I must admit. Thank you, I appreciate it. I congratulate you on your work. Natural, the, the natural pancreas responds to a high level of glucose by secreting insulin. Now, what, is there any idea how to control the release of insulin? Well, what I see here is a, an in vitro type I, release. I, I, thank you. The, thank you for the question. Uh, and the answer is yes. And I could spend another lecture how we do that. And in this paper that I showed that we could do it in the cell studies, yeah. we actually chose three different MOFs with a tiny, so the, uh, the coordination between the metal and the functional group, the strength of that is important. The stronger, the slower the release because the breaking is slower. The weaker, the faster the release. So technically we could start playing the game is Maybe that's what I said for some, uh, for some patients, you want to give them that slow release tablet versus for other patient, you want to give them the slow, the faster tablet. Or maybe after you eat kenafa, maybe you want the fast release tablet. Uh, and after you eat mensef, you need a different kind of tablet. <laughs> that's, the that's the whole idea. Uh, thank you. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding the gas storage. Um, I know we didn't get to talk about it, but um, how do you, like, what are the applications? Like, do you use it mostly, the sponges, for transportation, like, make, making it easier to transport natural gas, or do you use it for, like, filtration, like, cleaning CO2 from the air? Like, what are the... In our, you know, we really don't put all our eggs in one basket. We, bought, we work on, actually, three areas, four areas in that regard. One is, you know, storage not just really just methane, like other people in the field, we work on hydrogen storage, methane storage, but we do the separation, how can you remove you know, toxic gases from air? But recently we've been getting into one more storage application, into how do you stabilize unstable gases? Hello, Professor. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Appreciate it. I have a small question. So you show us beautiful curves, how encapsulating the enzyme in the MOF is preserving it in harsh conditions. I know that harsh conditions can still access the pores of the MOF. So how is the MOF stabilizing the enzyme and protecting it? I'm not aware if you mentioned this, so I'm just asking. No, I did not, but that's a good, because the mechanism of denaturation. So if the harsh condition will cleave the amide bond between amino acids, we have no way of stabilizing that enzyme. Because you cut a bond, we are done. But if the denaturation is happening because of dehydration or unfolding or hydrogen bonding, you know, deprotection, we could stabilize that. If you looked that we choose the channels to be not much larger than the enzyme. Typically enzymes for them to unfold they need that volume. Like imagine yourself stretching, you need that volume. If we don't give you that volume to stretch, you cannot unfold. And that's the way to do it. So if you put the enzyme in a cavity that is 10 times larger, you're absolutely right. You could denature it the way you would do it in solution. So basically this bond is being attacked, but since it's not allowed to stretch, it's being protected you and got preserved? It. You got it. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Ghaddar again. Uh, for the kinetics of oh, uh, the good. enzyme. I'm glad uh, somebody did ask. Is it, is it due to the difference in solution you have aggregated enzymes where the surface area is smaller than <coughs> when it so is molecular? Let me inside? tell you the three things we think is happening. We don't know exactly which one. I have my favorite and my student, uh, she has her favorite. Uh, the first one, we counting every enzyme. That's right. So you're absolutely right. In the solution, they could be aggregating. That means not every enzyme is used versus, remember I told you we put them and we get 95% of them accessible. We count every enzyme. That means I typically use the shish kebab example. They look like shish kebab there and everything is going versus the other one might not be the case. That's possible. The other thing that I think is happening, 
that those organic molecules, they like to be inside the crystals than they're in water. If you are inside the channels, now you're increasing the concentration of your substrate, and if you increase the concentration of your substrate, what's gonna happen to the kinetic of your, assuming you eliminate the diffusion. So why once that, one, that's one. why the, lo the last example I showed you with, now we have seven, eight MOFs, and it, all the MOFs are at one micron, this way we don't have a variation in crystal size. That means when we say this MOF is better than this MOF, we don't have the crystal size problem. We make them all one micron and we sift them to be one micron. The last thing, until two weeks ago, I thought I am right, you know, a pre concentration is the only solution. We found out in one enzyme that the, we have more of the active site available while it's encapsulated, and we don't know why, than in solution. How do we know that? It's an EPR active. It has very low EPR signal in solution. We put it in the moth, and the EPR signal shoots up. That means we are, you know, Stabilizing an unstable conformation. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's nice, nice to meet you, doctor. Good uh, to meet I you have as a well. question uh, with respect to chromophores. When you were saying that uh, we can detect uh, the, the presence of the enzyme inside because of chromos chromo chromophores. So if you were using the organic part, not as a, um, like it's not conjugated and it, you know, it's not chromophore. Can we still detect the enzyme inside? Oh, no, no. So the chromophore is actually not the ligand oh, on the moth. It's a chromophore that we attach to the enzyme. Oh, okay. So for the catalysis, you don't need that chromophore. This is just to show that we could, we attach the chromophore and we follow the chromophore inside the moth. Actually, to find the right chromophore is tricky because you need some of those pyrenes I showed you, those also fluoresce. That means we have to choose a chromophore has a different color than the ligand we use for our moth in order to show it. The second thing, if you use confocal, you cannot do it at the nano regime because you, know, you don't have the precision. That's why we go to about one micron to 10 micron and we see it over every 10 nanometers going through and we could get the slices and with the program we build a 3D image of those 2D slices. Uh. Can you give uh, the microphone to Dr. Yovana here, <coughs> all the way to the front? Dr. Yovana will be giving a seminar on Wednesday, but you know, Yovana, he's going to be asking you a question. Then Dr. Farha will be asking I'll, you a I'll question. I'll reciprocate. If you ask him today, he will be asking you on Wednesday. You well, know how it goes. I'll take the risk. Okay, go. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I'll follow up with the question regarding the interactions between and what actually stabilizes. So could you comment a bit further on what is the nature of this interaction? You mentioned the electrostatics. And how does this actually translate into the design of the of the? No, I mean, the, the electros, uh, the really, you could uh, measure at what pH you could, you could have either positive or neutral or negative charges on the surface of the enzymes. And depends which MOF, also you could measure the, you know, those, uh, you know, the opposite charges. So that's ele electrostatic interaction. But also, those pyrene moieties, the hydrophobicity of those, the enzyme likes to be interacting and be hugged in a way by those uh, hydrophobic interaction than just uh, inside solution and free. We are doing titration with ITC right now to determine for different MOFs and different enzymes, we have different interactions and we are now quantifying how much of those in, in, interactions, because that's important to answer the question here, how exactly. can we release that enzyme based under different conditions? Yeah. yeah. Building the basis for programmability, I think. Exactly. Presume. Thank you. So uh, before we close this wonderful session, I would like to remind you that Professor Farha will be delivering a mentoring talk at 5.30 p.m. right here in SLH. It is a non-technical talk completely different from this one. It will be more fun, actually. <laughs> Professor Farha's mentoring talk is entitled, Will Power Knows No Obstacles? Don't let where you begin limit where you go. We hope to see all of you tomorrow to another inspiring talk by Professor Farha. Thank Please you. join me in thanking him for this beautiful talk.
Thank you.